computer. I should have gotten into my computer before anything. But we're going to go just briefly through what I believe to be a Torah portion that is misunderstood many ways sometimes. And we don't see but one event coming out from this Torah portion that kind of marked everybody. So what I like to do is I'm going to circle around and give you a little bit uh, uh, more of a background. But how many of you know what Shabbat is, is today? Any significant Shabbats? I think Kiro put it in his, uh, or was it Robert put it in his slide? Anybody? Shabbat what? Okay. What does it mean? So it is the Shabbat of the red heifer. Shabbat para. And we had discussed before there are four Shabbatot, two before Purim, two before Pesach. There are special Shabbats in which we do these uh, special readings that we have talked about. And this is one of them. One of these special Shabbatot before Pesach. It is found, a special reading, if you find the book of Numbers, chapter 19, 1 through 22, you will find the reference with regards to this hook. Everybody knows what a hook is, right? Hukim hook, this is a, like a mandate that God tells his people to do regarding the red heifer. You'll find it in the book of Numbers, chapter 19. It speaks about it. It speaks about these ashes. And they're combined with this water in order to ritually purify whomever has become in contact with a corpse. Why? Well, let's read a little bit. I'm just going to read it for you if you can follow chapter 19. Well, the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, This is the ordinance, a hook of the law which the Lord has commanded. Speak unto the children, bring thee a red heifer without spot wherein is no blemish, and upon which never came a yoke. And then the priest, you may bring her forth without uh, the camp, and one shall slay her before his face. And the the priest shall take their blood in his fingers, sprinkle her with the blood directly before the tabernacle of the congregation seven times. And one shall burn the heifer in his side, her skin, the flesh, her blood, their dung and shawl he burns. And the priest shall take cedar wood, hyssop, scarlet, cast it in the midst of the burning of the heifer. Then the priest shall wash his clothes. He shall bathe his flesh in water. Afterward, he shall come into the camp. And the priest shall be unclean until the evening. And he that burned it, he shall wash his clothes in water, bathe his flesh in water, and he shall be unclean until the evening. And a man shall that is clean shall gather up the ashes of the heifer, lay them without the camp in a clean place, and it shall be kept for the congregation of Israel for a water of separation, it is a purification, for its purification of sin. He that gathereth the ashes shall wash also his clothes and be unclean until the eve. And it shall be unto the children of Israel, unto the stranger that sojourneth among them for a statue. How long? Forever. He that touches the dead body of any man shall be unclean for how long? Seven days. He then shall purify himself in it on the third day, and on the seventh, then he shall become clean. But if he purified not himself on the third day, on the seventh day, he shall not be clean. You think this God has got into the details of order. Whoever touches that dead body of a man is dead, is purified not himself, defileth the tabernacle of the Lord. So, we're leading into Pesach. So, the rabbis have chosen this over time, and we started all the way from Shabbat Shkalim, the Shabbat of the Shekel, to Shabbat of Sukkot of Remembrance, now into the Red Heifer. So it's like growing 
into even more significance of what is going to happen very shortly, which is actually that, Pesach. So ritual purity becomes the center. Ritual purity, in order to go into the temple and to participate in Pesach, is a process. So it's kind of leading you into that, that we must like Loretta was saying, introspectively, self-examine ourselves. We must, like you see here, follow a process in which we are in self going through this process of ritually getting cleansed before participating of the Pesach. So you see also here the Haftarah that was read, which is is Ezekiel. And it deals with the same issue of cleanliness. It was based basically on the impurities that were acquired, in this case, for sinful behavior, not with contact with the courts. Okay? As you read it here in the blue, it says, then, like we read in the Numbers. I will sprinkle clean water upon you. You shall be clean from all your uncleanness and from all your idols, which, which you heard earlier when they were reading the Haftarah. Will I cleanse you? A new heart also will I give you. A new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh and will give you a heart of flesh. There's no way we can achieve fellowship with the Lord and having the sensitivity to work within that realm unless we go through this process. And the process is we must first follow a cleansing. In other words, before we can present ourselves, it says this cleansing, okay, this renewal is not only as an individual, but it also applies as a nation as a whole. So that's what is presented here. And Passover is symbolically that, a reminder of, yes, what happened in Mitzrayim, in Egypt. But it's going to be what? Celebrated and remembered perpetually because it's also what? Tied up to redemption. They were redeemed out of Egypt and cleansed. Huh? So that's why Shabbat Para is put in this particular position here. So I just wanted to bring that up. Now, for this Torah portion, you see here, we start in uh, verse 1 of chapter 9, and it starts again with Aaron's offers sacrifices and goes through chapter 11, which are the dietary laws. And in between, we have some events. (laughs) In between, we have some events which tends to be where most people tend to concentrate on what about Parashah Shemini is all about. So let's look a little bit more about how we got to this point, okay? We started about two weeks ago with the book of Aikra. And what is the book of Aikra? Book of the Kohanim, the Levites, right? The book, it is, is basically the book of letting us know what the Levites had, are instructed to do, okay? And I put it here in a picture form sometimes because a picture is worth a thousand words, right? So if you recall, when we first started two weeks ago, Kirill brought a point about that first word found in Vaikra and the little Aleph that you see there at the end, this letter at the very end of the word. That's how the book starts. And that was a couple of weeks ago. We talked about that when the Lord called the Levites to duty on the Mishkan, we learned that it was through these korbanots, these sacrifices that were brought, and their significance, that Hashem established a pattern that He has shown Moshe, a pattern that He has shown from a heavenly realm. And how, through the study of His Word, and by using, like, Miguel said hermeneutics in interpretation of the word, we can connect and see 
how God was establishing the pattern because he was bringing heaven down to earth and wanted earth to go up to heaven. Right? You remember that far two weeks ago that we spoke about? Okay. Now, here in the book of Leviticus, Moshe, as you can see there in that little olive, the sages say must diminish. Why? Because somebody else has to come into office before the congregation. Who is that person? The new high priest. So the little Aleph is kind of an indication starting the book of Leviticus of where we're going. It starts very low, if you say, or very humble. The main character being Moshe, starting very low, so Aaron, who is the new high priest, can be increased before the people. Okay? So it denotes humility. The Midrash tells us that this little Aleph indicates a loving and close relationship. Kind of one like the one found in Isaiah 6.3 when it says, in the angel said, holy, holy, holy. They have a very close and loving relationship before the Father. And it continues to say that if that little Aleph were to disappear, then we have a conundrum. We have a problem. Because that word will no longer be any called. Vayikra. It would actually mean in Hebrew, Vayikar. Which is more like an accident. Like it happened. Okay? But not the kind of accident you and I are talking about. It's like something not good. That kind of accident like it was back out there today. Okay? if that little Aleph were to be removed. So just put yourself in the situation that if you look at it from the standpoint that not only from the letter that you're looking there, from the fact that God took the time that this is very specific and Hebrew is a uh, language of action. We see here a great element that the high priest whose responsibility was to be the mediator for the people before the creator of heaven and earth is required to be holy. Required. No if and buts about it. So now, if we have this situation here, we start humbly with a small aleph, and we move, and now we prevent from starting enough from a humble position. Guess what can happen? We can become what? An accident by car. We can become not holy, not ritually allowed to perform the duties. And just you find this in just this one word. Because after the Levites were called, the Lord commanded, consecrate them into service through a series of rituals that made, the acceptable, made them acceptable for service and ultimately ended anointing Aaron as the high priest of Israel. The Mishkan was erected for good, and the Levites, as you see there, are established as a perpetual priesthood. That brings us to Parashah Shemini. So you went from Parashah Vaikra to last week, Parashah Sav. And you heard that from Ron last week. And I think he spoke a little bit about what that picture you see there. He spoke a little bit leading up. And like he told me, he was just getting the gun ready. He cocked the gun back. And today is going to go off. In this Torah portion. <laughs> see? Because God was preparing them. And guess what? It's a new day. Shemini. And Shemini has a lot to do with not only new beginnings, but the miraculous. It's about the miraculous. So let's start there. 
That word you see up there, it is Shemini. In chapter 9, verse 1, we are past the consecration, the ordination, now the formal process of Aaron and his son's installation taking place in this eighth day. What is the eighth day considered in today's calendar? Anybody? The, the what? The first day of what? Nisan. Abib. So it is the eighth day, but it's actually not eight. It's one. It's starting. Okay? It's starting what? The Mishkan is starting the month, and that's why it's leading to this time of Pesach. Now, we have to think about Shemini as we read here in verse 1. That is on the eighth day that Moshe called Aharon, his son, the leaders of Israel, and, told, and said to Aharon, Take a male calf of a sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering, both without defect, and offer them before Adonai. We should ask ourselves all over again, more sacrifices. I thought we were done that earlier. I said, no, all over again. Just look here at verse 6. This is what Adonai has ordered you to do so that what happens? The kavod. Glory is the kavod of Adonai will appear to you. Did that happen before? He's doing and showing the process in front of the people that Aaron is responsible for. And you need to get this into the system. It is Aaron's responsibility and Mo is passed down from Moshe to Aaron now to do this. Because the Lord ordered it, so the glory or the kavod will appear. Approach the altar, offer your sin offering, and make atonement first for yourself and then for the people. Present the offering of the people, make atonement for them as Adonai order. Very important that glory was conditional in his appearance to Aaron's strict adherence to performing his duties. On him now rested the duties to mediate and by this process institute by God after the pattern showed to Moshe from a heavenly temple to make atonement for the people. You want that responsibility? Heavy responsibility. Very. Yes, Aaron, the first anointed, the first Mashiach, is now sitting there having to be responsible for this. But it is, why is it supernatural? Because the glory of God is supernatural. God is supernatural. The significance of that number eight is supernatural. What is the number of the Brit Milah? The number of circumcision is eight, right? What is the letter in the Hebrew alphabet for eight, corresponding to gematria. You see it on the screen. Who can identify that letter? Chen. It, right? So you got the word chen, chesed, grace, mercy. Do you deserve mercy? Do you deserve grace? Totally undeserving. But because it's supernatural... Because it's God-given, you receive it. See? It only works because he chose, because the same letter is a letter for life. In this age, that life is so devalued, because we don't value life, right? I'm not talking about myself. I'm talking about governments that are devaluing life. Right there, God is telling you it is supernatural that we get life. It was from the beginning. It says, it is tied up even to the kingdom. Does anybody know how? Who's the eighth son of Jesse? 
David Hamelech. Even there, we can see a pattern. We can go on with his number and his connotations, supernatural connotations. But we should have an expectation in our lives to pursue what Aaron is doing right here. He must be himself holy. Many definitions of holy out there, but we need to get the right one. Okay? We need to get the right one. So let's go there. What is holiness? What does the Bible tell you is holiness? It's not levitating above the people. It's not doing the most pious things that you can do. Exceptional work of sedaka, uh, good deeds. That's nothing to do with holiness. The first thing you have to do is by definition is separate yourself. That is holiness. So you're in the world, not of the world. So you need to separate yourself. That's the definition from the rest of the world as the definition for holiness. Now, are we all really in different levels of holiness? Aren't we? Does anybody care to guess? Well, we are. We are. Because it wasn't until Aaron completed this particular order set, up, set basically by Hashem that the kavod or the glory of God showed up. So he had to get into a level of what is known in Hebrew of Kedusha, holiness. And not everybody is in the same level of Kedusha. But it doesn't mean they're not holy. See how it gets complicated? Okay, so let me clarify that. Being separate, being set apart by God is a way to telling to the world and to everything, I belong to him and I've made a decision for the God of Israel, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So I set myself apart. But it doesn't stop there. Most people stop right there. I'm done. I made a decision. I'm holy. It means set apart. It goes beyond that. It does not stand on its own just to make that decision. It goes beyond that because it becomes a walk and it becomes and it starts going in levels. The only way that you can tie it up going from kavod to kavod, glory to glory, is doing and rising up to a level of kedusha, of holiness. But how can you do that? Does anybody have an idea? Just like the Mishkan, if you recall, was in the Mishkan, you started from the outside of the tabernacle, and as you moved in the Mishkan, there were levels of kedusha, holiness. Stuck our lives. You're at the door, but you don't stay there. You don't stay there. You need to go in. You need to rise up. Verse 23, you see here, Moshe Aaron entered the tent of meeting, came out, blessed the people, then the glory of Adonai appeared to all the people, and the fire came forth from the presence of Adonai. It says, consuming the burnt offering and the fat on the altar, when all the people saw it, they shouted and fell on their faces. And you see here in the Hebrew, this is what that phrase that you see there in black and bold is in Hebrew. Beatitzet ish. Mir Pene Adonai says, Vatuchal. Al Hamizbeak is the first one. What I want you to see is the pattern. You see it here, and this is verse 23. 
Okay? Ish. Fire. He brought it last week, and here it comes. <laughs> this fire came and did what? Consume. Consume al Hamizbeak in the altar everything that was laid out in the sacrifice because it was acceptable unto God. Now, if we are to be acceptable before the Lord, if we're going to be moving in a level that is getting closer to Him through our Kedusha, through our holiness, it's only going to come with our actions. Okay? But what happened here? First, Aaron's actions brought the glory down because they were what? Good before the Lord. It's very important to understand that when you're playing with the kavod, the glory of God, the phrase applies. You're playing with fire. And in verse 1, of the next chapter. You are going to see where the pattern connects again. And Nadab and Avihu, the Bnei Aaron, each took their censer and put esh therein, and put incense ketoret therein, and offer esh sarah, foreign or strange fire, before Hashem when he commanded them not. And there went out Fire again from the presence of Hashem. You see it right here, exactly the same words. Exactly the same words. For well, the last two words, James. Eh? Here, it consumed the sacrifice on the altar. Here, it consumed them. The same glory that found it that it was acceptable and consume the perfect sacrifice it was the same glory that came and consumed them it wasn't another kind of glory it was exactly the same one exactly the same one so we're constantly warning our children don't play with fire. We're warning them, right? Well, these are Aaron's children. Okay? And this is a great illustration of a much bigger principle found in the Torah. The principle here found is that all of us are not on the same level of Kedusha. We're not on the same level of holiness. It doesn't mean we're not holy. Or set apart. Okay? But all of them, all of us are Kodesh, Tadosh, set apart. Now, this is not some physical higher state or material higher state, but it is a spiritual condition. We acquire, again, like I said earlier, through our actions. As our level of Kedusha increases, we're able to experiment and experience a greater level of God's glory. And you see it here with the high priest. The example is found when Aaron and Moshe versus Nadav and Abihu. The question is, do you believe that Nadav and Abihu were Kedoshim? Were they holy? Kedoshim? Yes? No? Yes. Absolutely! Actually, in Judaism, they're known as Kedoshim Gedolim. Greatly. Greatly. Sadiqs. But what happened? What were they doing? They were, in fact, trying to perform 
something that was out of their level of Kedusha. They're, in fact, trying to make Tikkun. What they're saying is Tikkun is a rectification. The people had gone through the golden calf. Remember that? They're trying to make a rectification, but guess what? They took something that is beyond their level of Kedusha. Something that was set for a higher level of Kedusha. It belonged to Aaron. So, their intentions were good. But by taking that position that did not correspond to that, in fact, they were outside. And that's what happened. They played with fire. We in our lives, we are Kedoshim. We're set apart. We're all set apart. We made a decision, but we are in what? In the process of moving off from that glory to glory in everything we do. But be careful if you get out of your lane. I'm not saying the consequences necessarily have to be death, like you see here. But you're telling and showing here the most extreme of the cases where you're messing with God's glory. Okay? And they're not the only ones, do we? We have other examples. We have other examples. What are they? Well, it's easy to find in the Haftarah. Haftarah, book of 2 Samuel, chapter 6, verse 6. I'll read it for you. When they arrived at Nahon, threshing floor, the oxen stumbled, and Uzzah put out his hand, steady the ark of God, but Adonai's anger blazed up against Uzzah, and God struck him down on the spot of his offense, so he died there by the ark of God. Was Uzzah Kadoshim? Yes. He was. He was holy. He was set apart. He was one of the uh, uh, children of God. But what? He, again, overstepped over his level of holiness. He shouldn't be handling the ark. And he did. Even though it was great in intention. Actually, the rabbis teach that we are not to sustain the ark. Is the ark to sustain us? Isn't that the ark of the covenant? Isn't that the mercy seat? Is the ark that sustain us? Not we sustain the ark. They even say, hey, the ark will not get damaged. The ark is the ark of God. It would have positioned itself. They go on to elaborate some of the things. But this is same kind of example that you find here. After David had prepared such a welcoming party for this ark to be returned to Zion, after consulting with the elders of the tribes, first mistake, they put the ark on a cart. <laughs> huh? You don't find that in the instructions. See? The question was, Uzzah, was he insane when his life was taken, when he touched the ark? Remember, the ark is a symbol of Hashem's Shekinah, his kavod, his glory. And now was being handled by an Israelite improperly. Beyond his level of Kedusha. Even though he must have had a great deeper meaning and intention to try to save, he was not qualified to do so. And in our walk, we're going to encounter that. God, I want to help. I want to do this. I want to do that. Hold on. You got more training to go for. You're not quite there yet. Or you haven't been set apart of this. This is what is set apart for you. And sometimes it's hard for us to accept. No, no, but I want to do this. Where is it? We need to be careful because we have example after example and here's the quintessential one here with the Levites. But we are with no temple. What are we? Kings 
and breathed. It is our duty to what? To seek a greater Kedusha. Right? A greater level of holiness each and every day of our lives. The book of Hebrews chapter 12 says, Rasha is speaking about how God loves us. And he also what? Discipline us so we can produce a good fruit, fruit of righteousness. Verse 6, for Adonai disciplines those he loves and whips everyone he accepts as his son. He said now in verse 14, and we read, keep pursuing peace with everyone and the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. No one will see the Lord without the holiness. It said, then he warns them about rejecting Yeshua the Messiah, who is the mediator and the author and the finisher, right? In verses 28 and 29, it reads, therefore, since we have received the unshakable kingdom, let us have grace through which we may offer service that will please God with reverence and fear. For indeed, what's the last word? God is a consuming fire. Coincidence? Here you see him. It's either going to consume the perfect sacrifice or it's going to consume something else to transcend that glory. So we love it. We need to guard and build our Kedusha. Okay? How? How do we do that? Practice. A professional player of any kind gets to that level because they they're not born know how to play ball and shoot that little ball through that hoop. They need to practice and practice and practice to become and excel. Well, this is not unlike us. We need to practice. How do we practice? Leviticus 11.2. Everybody goes to Leviticus 11 and said, oh, dietary laws. Isn't it? Dietary, okay. But it's not really important. We just, we basically already went through the most important thing. The two guys getting barbecue. Practice. It says in Leviticus chapter 11, verse 2, speak unto the children of Israel saying, these are the living things which you may eat. Among all the bees that are on the earth. Where here's how you practice. You practice through actions and obedience to God. It is a way in which how we strengthen our Kedusha. And it is a way in which we do everything that we need to do to be able to reach a greater level of Kedusha. So we can go from glory to glory. That's how it works. In the next chapter, we find the instructions of how can we become holy. Wait a minute. I thought this was about food. I thought this chapter was about food. Isn't it? Right? Is it about food? No! It mentions food, but it's beyond food. Much more. Why? Because you read here, 44, for I am the Lord your God, sanctify yourself and be ye holy as I am holy. So what is this inserted there for? It's much more than food. It's about holiness. It's about setting apart. Food is just a physical representation, a physical need of a much greater need that we have. Our spiritual need. To have a relationship with the one true God. Only obtained through holiness. Approaching a holy God. We can do so by denying ourselves the physical aspects of our needs. The worldly aspects. In order to reach the spiritual aspects of God. So God demands this from us. God is not going to do it for us. 
We need to do it. As you can see there in verse 44, it says, sanctify yourself. Well, how do you do that? I'm going to get one of these and just sanctify myself over the head? It doesn't work like that. You sanctify yourself exactly through doing his votes. That's why he placed them there. Okay? We find here that sanctifying yourself from this term means that holiness and the term you see in the Hebrew right here in black. What it means is in the, in the perfect tense, what it means is you're actually in a process of sanctification. Because you already set yourself apart. That started a process of sanctification. That's what I'm saying. It doesn't stay there. It's continual. It's daily. It's a process. Once you begin that, once you engage in that sanctification, then the second part takes place. And the second part is, for I am holy. He is right there with you, helping you along. Day by day. So, curiously speaking, you see here that day by day our actions should be first, when you wake up, what's the first thing you do when you go to the kitchen? Eat breakfast, right? Most people don't skip breakfast. Most people go and have coffee and breakfast. So, the first thing we have to think about, that's physical. Physical, now I'm getting what? Inside my body. What I think I crave or what I need. But guess what? Have you ever heard of this phrase? <laughs> I was talking to Joey about that last night. You are what you eat. Or... Coming from the computer world sometimes, Gigo. You know what that Gigo is? Garbage in, garbage out. In the old times. So Hashem even had that plan. It said in order to give him from a heart of stone to a heart of flesh. Even in the food. He's instituted that because that from the inside is changing us. Everything we know about these dietary laws, people try to tie it up strictly to the physical. Oh, because it's health benefits and this and that. Much more than that. Higher. Think higher. It's all spiritual. Okay? God gives these instructions so you can find levels of kedusha or holiness and in that process, you get what? More of him. You can get more of him when you stay here, when you don't perform this, when you don't, are unwilling to move from there. You can't. So what he's trying to tell you is, you know, we're trying to bring before you is that this is the way he operates, in this manner. If you conduct yourself in observing these instructions, we are, in fact, working in that sanctification together with him, okay? It is in our daily process. Our lives will be, in fact, in fact, impacted by the supernatural God because he's working hand in hand with us, moving us into, from glory to glory. If we don't, we're stuck, and we're stuck in the physical realm, okay? We're stuck in the observance Oh, we're not just going to do this because God tells me to do it. There's no Kedusha in it. There's no way you're approaching God. You're doing it all on your own. See? It's not that at all. God wants to do it with you. He wants to, you for you to be able to transcend the physical. Okay? He wants you to move you up. Now, it certainly applies that we are sanctifying ourselves like I read a minute ago by separating ourselves. And, and this is one way, in the way we eat. 
First, in our insights and obviously with our action. And this is how the missed votes have behind it the purpose. But all in all, the missed votes, for the sake of missed votes, are no good. The missed votes, without the, God's intent in doing the missed vote, in order to reach and get closer to his glory, are no good. Now, performing the actions with the desire to see God in the midst of the action, that brings down his kavod. That brings out his glory. That gives you the heart. That gives you, that's what the Torah gives you. See? Because you're not doing it for doing it. To fulfill this requisite. No. You're doing it just like he instructed. You're sanctifying yourself so you can approach a holy God. A holy God. Now, there's always questions. <laughs> I have questions for you. Do you do your avodah to Hashem? Or avodah basar? Now let me explain what that means. Avodah is service. Okay? So, do you do your service to Hashem or do you do your service so you get, stay in the physical? Basar. That's the flesh. So you can satisfy that. Oh, I did it. I've done it. I fulfill it. Another question is, is your service connecting you to the supernatural or does it remain in the physical? Because the fact is, Avodah Hashem in our daily life is to bring the glory so you can experience God's glory each and every day. Each and every day that you do Avodah Hashem, He is with you, what? Supernaturally imparting. In the most mundane thing, you might see it, oh, that's God. But now what? But now you're trained. Now you can see it because you're doing it and doing it every day, doing it every day. Not only a Shabbat, only what I remember. See, that's the training. That's the level of Kedusha. That is the doing. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And rep. That creates not a habit, yes, in one side. But the other side of the coin of that habit is that God in that is what? Lifting your level of kedusha, lifting your level of holiness, lifting. And what I mean by lifting is that you're going up to him. It doesn't mean you're levitating somewhere. See? Because what happens? The more kedusha is, the more fruit of his spirit it will show. It's not yours. It's his. So these are questions that we should ask ourselves especially now as we go through this period of Pesach. So he is asking you or telling you, be holy if I am holy. Amen? Shabbat shalom. Let's pray. Abba Kadosh, we come before you, lifting and exalting your holy name. Father God, we know that each and every day of our lives, we need to pursue you with all our strength, with all our might. For it is only in that pursuit that you teach us. Let us do it in a manner that is holy and acceptable unto you, humbly before you, so we can uh, lift up your name, so we can acknowledge your name, so we can bring your name before others. They can see the mighty uh, God that you are, the good God that you are. Thank you, Father, for you have shown and instructed us through your word. Keep opening our hearts to that and keep opening our minds so they will be uh, moldable and acceptable so we can always be before you in this manner, acceptable before you. Cleanse us, forgive us, and make us acceptable this as we lead into this special time of Pesach. We thank you and we bless you. B'Shem Yeshua, we pray. Amen and amen. All right, let's stand so we can dismiss.